awkward cough. Here we go. Give it a minute and let folks wander in. Seems like a good time to text my wife. Pop. Hello, Linda. How you doing? All right. Well, uh, I am still not Pastor Borghart. Uh, I'm Pastor Goodman, filling in. Uh, for a little bit again. We uh, remember Pastor Borkhart and his family in our prayers this day um, as they are struggling with uh, Big Rona. Um, we continue to to, um, to remember that, that our Lord is, is uh, victor over sin and death and, and rejoice in uh, even the, the trials and temptations that he would uh, give us in good gifts. Good afternoon, Cheryl. Hey, Jean, good to see you again. Terry Lynn. Debbie, how's everybody doing? It's great to see you guys today. Uh, we are picking up in uh, Genesis. Hey, Cindy, what's up? Uh, we're continuing along in, in, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 49. Pastor Borghart, good to see you. How you feeling, man? Uh, Maggie, good afternoon. Um, hey, Judy. So we are finishing up uh, the, the, the blessing. Of um, hey Brenda, the blessings that that uh, Jacob would give uh, his his uh, his sons as he is lying on his deathbed and uh, ready to to enter into glory. Uh, we have one more, uh, the the last but not uh, the least, uh, the youngest uh, brother to, to cover this day. So we'll we'll dive in uh, to to look at Benjamin. We are in Genesis uh, chapter forty nine, beginning at verse twenty seven, and we'll zoom in on my ADHD. Here we go. All right. So, um, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning, devouring the prey, and at the evening, devouring or dividing the spoil. Um, the, the fathers have, have taken this to, to be somebody who would um, enter into the scene as an enemy of God, uh, but then uh, through, through grace and mercy be transformed into... Uh, into a vessel of mercy, into somebody who would actually uh, stop hurting the kingdom, but actually winning for it. And so the, the clearest reference then to the scriptures would, would be uh, Saul, who, who became Paul. Uh, Saul, who in his early life was a ravenous wolf, who was uh, there at the, at the martyrdom of, of Stephen, um, earnestly, uh, probably, uh, even at the crucifixion of Christ, he would have not missed uh, the Passover to be a Pharisee in high regard at this standard. Uh, but also Paul, who uh, by, by the Lord's blessing and, and gift, uh, was, was actually uh, brought to faith, uh, brought to, to be a, a preacher of the, of the very word to the people whom he once persecuted. That um, Paul uh, would be, uh, through, throughout his life, actually used as a vessel of, of good. Uh, Pastor Borghart's jumping in. Amy's feeling better. Still no taste. Uh, OG4, no taste, but he seems to be bouncing back. Praise God, Sophia, still no symptoms, and Thomas is having a blast, feeling great. I can't imagine what that would look like. Uh, Pastor Borghart is exhausted with a capital E and having a declining headache. I'll see if I can't ramp that headache back up by the end of this Bible study. Um, we'll, we'll see where we go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody else jumping in too. Uh, it's great to see you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, so we, we are again kind of looking at the blessing of, of uh, given to Benjamin. Um, and, and we see uh, kind of an image of, of Paul who... Um, as Saul was was a ravenous wolf, but uh, throughout his life, uh, as he was called by the gospel, enlightened with his gifts, sanctified and kept in the true faith, uh, was actually a, a gift to the church. He, he was the apostle through whom Christ would preach uh, even to the Gentiles. Uh, but also in this, we could maybe even consider um, ourselves. Uh, it, it's a good chance to reflect upon all of us who, who are brought into this world uh, conceived in sin. All of us are, are ravenous wolves, enemies of God. If we were to go to, to uh, Ephesians 2, we, we can almost watch this played out. Uh, 
you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind this isn't just you know Saul and Paul who does this on a, a grand scale but this is every last person born uh, dying uh, born in sin uh, born with old Adam uh, not not just sort of uh, scratching but but alive and well and uh, controlling every last aspect of us but the mercy of God is poured out not to those who deserve it uh, but to sinners for by grace you have been saved by faith and not by works you who are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked were made alive in Christ Jesus and so here we we have um also a, a new man who who is is brought forward you were um in your youth sons of disobedience and daughters too and once alive you have actually been um made so holy that holy works would be brought to brought forth through you. Uh, you would do the good works that God has prepared beforehand, that you would walk in them. Uh, not just sort of that, that God has uh, enlivened you to make good choices, but that he actually wants to accomplish good for you, through you, and for your neighbor. Um, consider again the, the, the blessing given to Benjamin and, and see yourself in there in the evening, dividing the spoil. Um, could we adjust the volume up a little bit, please? We can give it a go. All right, I'm I'm kind of cranking it here, so uh, also I would I would hope uh, maybe we can we can turn the volume up on uh, your own speakers as well. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, look at yourself. Benjamin is a, a ravenous wolf, old Adam, and God in His mercy makes you a new man uh, daily through the baptism. This isn't just sort of a, a once I was lost and now I'm found. Once I was naughty, but then I. I loved Jesus and now I'm nice. This is every single day inside of us that that every day old Adam tries to, to resurface and every single day in the waters of baptism he is drowned all over again that God would continue to pour forth good work through sinners. And then you can grab hold of Paul as, as he talked about uh, uh, or as some of the commentators and the, the church fathers have talked about uh, this being in reference to Paul made alive in Christ no longer Saul still calls himself chief of sinners not I used to be chief of sinners and now I am so much better than everybody else and if you would just be like me no now Paul actually says emulate my behavior even as he calls himself the chief of sinners because maybe the thing to emulate in Paul's behavior is not just how he follows the law but but how he takes refuge in the gospel from the law now we can follow uh, the, the pattern that Paul has set forth for us, not just in love to our neighbor, but, but chiefly in the confession of our sins to God and the reception of his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, life, and salvation. That, that whole Romans 7 kind of vibe that we have Paul who, um, even as he calls you to, to um, in a different epistle, emulate him, also says, I can't do the good that I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do is what I keep on doing. And finally just throws up his hands to the whole mess and says, who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Here we have something to emulate, the, the old Adam daily being drowned, the new man daily arising. Uh, and this is this is a wonderful thing that God would be at work inside of not just the, the, the sort of the heroes of our faith, but everybody in their baptism to accomplish these these good things. Um, so that was the last of the, the, the 12 blessings. Um, I'm glad that's better. I'm glad it's uh, a little bit louder. Thanks for uh, the heads up, Maggie. Uh, let's let's keep going then. Uh, Genesis 49, 28. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, this is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. And then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre in the land of Cana, which Abraham bought with the field of, from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. Um, we'll get there. Let's take one more look at the blessings. The 12 tribes he blesses. The, the 12 tribes he blesses. Even the ones that, that uh, things don't seem so nice to. Uh, can I make me smaller? That's usually what I want to do anyway. Hey, Goodman, be, be tiny. Go away. Ooh, ooh. Maybe we'll do this. Square. Square, Goodman. There we go. All right. Um... At least uh, from the, the outside, it, it almost looks like uh, as as uh, Jacob delivers these blessings, especially to Levi, Simeon, and Reuben, they, they seem cursed. 
Um, he, he doesn't necessarily say everything's going to be great for you guys. And, and remember, we'll have to go back a, a little bit for this. Um, but uh, as we, we, we sort of go back to these, these things, uh, what we have is, uh, is hip to be square. Thank you, Pastor Borkart, for the, the very timely reference. Um, Simeon and Levi are, are weapons of violence. Um, let my soul not come into their counsel. O my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, in their wilfulness they hamstrung uh, the, the oxen. Um, these, these blessings that are, are, are poured forth sometimes don't seem like it. But again, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel are blessed. Uh, recognize that even sinners are numbered with the saints here and rejoice. Recognize that, um, yes, uh, Levi, Simeon, Reuben did bad things. Sin. Sinning is bad. It breaks stuff. Don't sin. But the mercy of our Lord is that he would not simply number us with uh, the, the goats for being sinners. But he will measure us according to kind, according to mercy. These are the 12 sons of Israel. And so these are the 12 given blessing. If you want to measure it by who made good choices and who made bad choices, there are not a lot left uh, to, to be blessed. But Jacob blesses all 12 of his sons. Um, this is not on account of their works. This is on account of God's covenant. Uh, the wonderful thing about this, this whole thing being done, is that even though you, you can say, well, I'm glad I'm not uh, Levi, uh, you, you can also say the sinner's blessings are tied to God's promise. Um, Ezekiel would say, I have no desire in the death of the wicked, but that they would turn from their way and live. So it's not that God is, is pleased with the actions of, of uh, the, these sinners. Clearly he's not. But at the same time, um, God is, is pouring out blessings even to those who do not deserve it. It's sort of the point of our whole religion. A and it's a wonderful thing to actually see being done, uh, especially when it happens to us. Uh, the church is, is this day just a whole bunch of sinners who do not deserve good blessings from God given nothing but that. Consider the baptism that is given not to the worthy, but to the little helpless children, to the sinners who are, who are born in iniquity, who are born as enemies of God. Uh, consider us that, that are, are brought into God's grace and mercy, and then daily uh, forgiven, daily made new, and more. God would continue to pour out blessings, not upon those who have earned it, but upon those who need it upon upon those for whom god is loved upon the cross upon those that god is merciful towards consider the office of the keys a uh, confession and absolution is is so clearly not a, a good gift from god that is given to the worthy because well confession has two parts first that we confess our sins and second that we receive absolution that is forgiveness from the pastor as from god himself not doubting but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before god in heaven if god is only going to give good gifts to the worthy there would be no such thing as confession and absolution in the church but god ties you as a sinner to his mercy and grace that you would not be known by your sins but you'd be known by the identity which he bestows upon you you would be known by your kind you are a sheep of god's own fold you are a child of his own family you are a son and a daughter of of Abraham by the waters of your baptism, here God would actually pour out a mercy that would no longer be tied to your works. And we can send, then then sort of hold both both uh, the, the, the temporal realm and the spiritual realm in, in uh, the same hand here. And we can say, I, I, I sin a lot and it breaks stuff and there's going to be consequences for that. The forgiveness of sins does not mean that my life will be happy as I sin and it breaks stuff around me. In fact, sin begets more sin. But at the same time, I must never ever doubt who I am in Christ my Lord, who is merciful to me, a sinner. I must never doubt that even in the midst of consequences that, that I have usually brought upon myself, God would somehow forsake me to these things. I, I, I must never think that. Instead, I would rejoice that he, he comes to me in my need and, and um, often sort of softens the consequences of sins because otherwise I'd be dead by now. Uh, in the large catechism, Luther talks about that. He says one of the most merciful things God does is that he tempers the, the effects of uh, sin, but not too much. Um, in other words, sin breaks stuff. Uh, but at the same time, God will not just simply hand us over to it and let us learn the hard way. Uh, he, he's not the, the father that, that says, you know, I'm going to push you in the pool and tell me if you learn to swim. Uh, he is, however, the father will, that, that will allow us to, to get the little slap on the hand to make sure that we learn, hey, that hurt. I don't want to do that again. Uh, if, if I were to actually face the full actual 
reasonable effects of the sins that I've committed in this life, I would have been dead a long time ago. Uh, it's a miracle that I survived as a teenager. It, it, it actually is a miracle. God tempered the effects of the law, uh, but at the same time, he also used it to, to chastise, to, to sort of um, mold me into the thing that would be slightly less of a walking dumpster fire, slightly less uh, of a walking tornado that would hurt the people around me. In all of this, though, God is working uh, not, not according to, to simply what people deserve, but in the same way that uh, he blesses the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, he, he gives a, a blessing even to the sinners because these are the people he has mercy on. Uh, for, from here, uh, we can start to deal with, with the Jacob who, who dies. Um, we can start to deal with uh, Jacob who, who crawls up into his bed and goes to sleep. Uh, again, let's sort of continue down here. Uh, from the cave, um, let's go to 4933. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed, and he breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. And Joseph fell on his father's face, and wept over him, and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. For D -D or 40, I'm sorry, I was laughing at 80 references, and COVID and Pastor Borkhart. Uh, 40 days were required for it, for that is how many were required for embalming, and the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. Um, there's a, a godly way to die and, and a, a, a not-so-godly way to die. Um, I want to talk about sort of the, the language of, of faith and death. Um, I, I want to talk about sort of how we, um, we witness uh, Jacob falling asleep in our Lord and how we can be taught to do the same. Uh, he, he drew up his feet into the bed. Um, in other words, he's sitting on his bed, giving these last blessings, and, and as soon as he finishes, he, he sort of just snuggles up, all bugging a rug, and he goes to sleep. This is something that, that should sound at least a little bit familiar to you. Um, we go to Luke 8.52. Um, all were weeping and mourning for this little girl, but Jesus said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. Uh, what we have is, is um, a, a merciful God who will not leave us uh, into the pit of death. But Jacob, in faith, doesn't die. He goes to sleep because he's trusting in the same resurrection. And, and he's a part of that same salvation worked in Christ who died upon the cross and rose not just for the people in the New Testament, but, but also for him. Uh, it, it says he was gathered to his people. And again, this is a wonderful, wonderful promise being uh, enacted, being boldly confessed uh, by, by Moses as he writes this. So um, for, for Moses to simply state, Jacob was gathered to his people. He, he's saying there's actually something that goes on after you die. Uh, there, there's actually something that, that goes on um, spiritually that, that uh, even then, uh, before they saw the resurrection of Christ, they hoped for. The thing hoped for yet not yet seen, I think we'll get there. Um, Hebrews 11.9, uh, by faith he went to live in this land of promise as a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Jacob, falling asleep in Christ, goes to be with Abraham and Isaac. Not because he was worthy, but again, because of the same promise trusted in the same promise. And, and this promise is the thing that unites us. Uh, this promise is the thing that, that connects us to our people, um, even as, as Jacob is connected to also us, our people. Uh, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and, and sin which clings to us so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, it lets us start to talk about the kingdom of, of, of heaven um, in, a, in a wonderful way. Um, that, that falling asleep, being brought up into the, 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 uh, the cloud of great witnesses, he, he joins the faithful. Um, but the faithful aren't simply the, the be-all, end-all of, of, of heaven where we wait for the resurrection. 
Um, first, heaven isn't the be-all, end-all, the resurrection is, but, but second, even just the cloud of witnesses is also more. Even as Paul writes, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Everybody, everybody looks to Jesus. We, with that same cloud, look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross for sinners, for you, for me, for all. The great cloud of witnesses are those who are saved by Christ. It, it is the, the great cloud who, who are united around his gifts and his mercy. So when we talk about him seated at the right hand of the throne of God, we talk about heaven being then um, where, where God is. So the cloud of witnesses are those uh, with Jesus resting from their labors until the great resurrection from the dead. But you, you are surrounded by that cloud. He is gathered to his people. But the, the wonderful, merciful part of, of, of our Lord is that he would not simply wait until we die to let this start to happen to you. And notice as, as um, the, the author of Hebrews uh, writes this thing, um, I, I think Paul, but but I've, I've heard a lot of good arguments otherwise. Uh, it doesn't. I well, That's another argument for another day. Um, the, the author of Hebrews talks about, though, the great cloud of witnesses who, who are, are um, sheltered uh, around the throne of the lamb clothed in white robes brought out of the great tribulation we'll get there um i think it's next oh it's next uh but this this great cloud of witnesses it surrounds you like not after you die but you right now because it's actually talking about letting us uh run the race set before us let us lay aside every weight every sin the great cloud of witness surrounds you at a place where you can kneel down and lay off every sin that you would have the strength to run the race set before you. Uh, the great cloud of witnesses is at the communion rail for you. The great cloud of witnesses um, rejoice with you as, as you run the race set before you, not by your own strength and endurance, but by looking to Jesus who is present for you on that altar. Uh, bread and wine that are the body and blood of Jesus for you, that you would have the strength not only the forgiveness that would lay aside every weight, the forgiveness that would take the sin from you and just drop it so you can actually run this race set before you. Uh, as we kneel at this altar, we kneel shoulder to shoulder with all of the saints. We sing it in the liturgy uh, with, with angels and archangels and with uh, so great a cloud of witnesses, all the company of heaven. Heaven and earth are not so far apart. That's what I'm saying. You don't have to die to be gathered unto your people. In, in, in God's mercy, he gives you that gift now so that you won't have to wait. You, you can be united with those who have fallen asleep in faith, this great cloud of witness at a place where you can lay aside every sin, where you can um, run the race with endurance, where you can look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith. Over and over and over again, the author of Hebrews paints a picture of the Lord's Supper, where you can have all of these things now because they are for you. Go to, to the Lord's Supper and receive the body and blood as a gift from God that you would have this mercy, not just when you die and don't need it anymore, but, but right now. Uh, because you can actually then start to paint yourself in into to the scriptures. Uh, it, it, everybody's favorite text from Revelation, or maybe it should be at least. Um, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's my favorite in Revelation because it's the place where I'm actually there. Because it's, it's those who are brought out of the great tribulation clothed in white robes. It, it's the baptized who are tied to the kingdom of God even now. It's the saints. It's, it's me. I'm, 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 in, I'm, I'm in the book. It's, it's right there. Revelation 7, 14. That's you, baptized child of God, brought out of the great tribulation. Uh, the, the, the revelator, John, sees you uh, among so many other great clouds of witnesses. The, the great cloud of witness. He sees you in, in mercy. He sees you in your baptism. He sees you united to your people even here and now, which might actually be a good thing uh, in a day and age where we need a uh, virtual Bible study because getting together can be hard. Um, here, rejoicing in our baptism. God unites us together in a way that time and space sort of have to bend to God's will and mercy because uh, he, he would not have us be kept apart. He would have us not be kept apart so firmly that even in death, he would pull us back out of the grave and draw us together. Uh, but he gives us that gift now. We look to his sacraments where he, he defies death and distance alike to unite us together under him who is Christ the head. It's just beautiful. Um, Jacob is... is uh, gathered to his people, the passive tense. He doesn't go to his people. He is gathered to his people. God picks him up out of this tomb, out of this deathbed, and he says, nah, you can go be with your fathers.
and, and eventually we'll, we'll see him buried there to to actively confess this faith. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. But but that if he was gathered to his fathers, it again lets us start to speak of those people we're a little less sure of. Um, Ishmael is talked about the same way. I don't know if that was uh, pointed out, but when Ishmael fell asleep, he was gathered to his people. That's that's word that's verbiage for a, a, a somebody who died in the faith. Uh, that, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, Brenda, the earth is round. I'm sorry. Uh, just looking at the comments. Uh, I'm not sorry. I'm glad it is. You can go on airplanes and stuff. Go. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we are gathered uh, this way through our baptism. Um, Ephesians talks about us being knit together into one body that is Christ the head. Uh, Hebrews, again, talks about us uh, being heirs to the promise, heirs uh, united. So, so if we are both heirs under the Father, then we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it's a, a great thing. And that way we can deal with how we died. And honestly, how we see a lot of us die. Um, if, if you like you, you like the old Stoics or, or like old, old action movies, um, or, or even just sort of that, that guy code that comes with it, uh, there's a lot of talk about like dying with dignity, dying with honor. Um, and I liked that until I had to put one of these on and start going to be with people while they died. And um, it was a really heartbreaking experience because these were people that I, I, I grew to love and I certainly respected. And I watched them fall asleep in our Lord wearing diapers sometimes. Um, I watched them fall asleep in our Lord gasping for breath. Uh, not as many people who I think should have just sort of gone to sleep and woke up in heaven got to. And they all sang hymns on the way out. <laughs> they died with hope. If you want to do this uh, based on sort of your ability, um, the, the idea that we would die with dignity or die with honor is sort of an attempt to conquer that last enemy, death, on your own. That I can go out in such a way that death can't sting me. I can go out in such a way that I'll be remembered outside of this moment where I have, you know, the, the, the grown-up diaper on or, or the, the tubes in me or, or, you know, the hospital gown that lets my butt all flap around. Uh, it, it, instead, we, we die in hope because we don't need to defy ourselves. Uh, we have a, a God who, who defies death for us. Uh, 70 days, yes, was the traditional length of, of mourning laid out there. The, the number seven is significant, I think, huh? Just maybe. Um, something about a Sabbath rest. Um, we, we die in hope because that actually does conquer death. Our hope is in Christ who conquered it for us. Um, there's a language that, that comes to, to meet death, um, and, and it confesses something. As we, we start to talk about how we then ourselves would uh, would, would die, um, what we have is uh, a, a way that we can actually start to approach our own things. And there's an important question along everything that comes to do with funerals, because people do some weird stuff at funerals, and sometimes it's hard uh, to, to actually deal with in a, a loving way because, well, it's a funeral. People are sad, man. Like, allow people to be sad. Uh, the, the, the time where you're hurting because you've lost somebody you love, uh, the time that is one of the worst days of your life, that might not be necessarily the time where you're the most open to learn new things. It's the time to fall back on the things you know, which is why we can talk about uh, really uh, interesting things during Higher Things Virtual Bible Study, but on your deathbed you just want the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer because God is merciful to you. Um, there's, there's a reason that we fall back on the simple things, but inside of a funeral, though, when all the wacky stuff is going on, there's actually a pretty simple way to, to start to parse these things. Um, what does this confess it is an important question to ask when all of these things are happening. Like, what what are you saying by doing this thing? What are you trying to say by doing those things? Because they're not always the same thing. Uh, what does this confess it is, is a way that we actually start to, to um, fall back on the, the, the well, the, the worship and the doctrine, the, uh, meeting the practice of our church. Everything that we do in, in uh, the sanctuary confesses something. It, it speaks to something. When your pastor wears vestments, it, it confesses something. When he kneels, it confesses something. Uh, even when he sings or, or chants, it confesses something. And so too at a funeral. Uh, and we want to be careful that, that what we mean to say is actually the thing that's being perceived. Because, um, well, I, I know from this book of Genesis that the, the rainbow um, what was a sign given to Noah as, as a mark, a, a seal, a promise, a covenant that God would not uh, look at us in wrath and flood the world again, but it's a sign of hope that he would look at us in mercy. Um, so I should definitely wear my rainbow colored stole, right? Except Somebody else came along and stole that. We had it first, the rainbow, but uh, somebody came and took it from us, and now it means 
something else to most people. And so I can't wear my rainbow stole. I don't actually have a rainbow stole, uh, but if I did, I couldn't wear it. Um, I don't have a rainbow stole, though, for this reason. Uh, it, it would confess something I didn't mean it to say. Uh, in the same way, um, Halloween is uh, apparently coming. Uh, it's uh, September 1st, and my neighbors put out big Halloween decorations. Uh, some people are into that. Uh, I, I like a free candy. I love that. Uh, um, and, and I also sort of just like a chance to mock the devil and remind him that uh, he, he's nothing more than a child in a fake costume uh, when I am clothed in the armor of God, uh, who is the victor over him. Uh, but, but, but anyway, um, what was I talking about? Uh, when, we, when we sort of... Yeah, I don't remember what I was talking about at all. I was thinking about candy, and I got off track. That happens sometimes. Um, oh, what does this confess on Halloween? Um, I can't. I can't dress up as a ghost with a pointy hat. Um, because that that looks like something else that people would would misread. You shouldn't dress up as a ghost with a pointy hat. What you mean to say and what you actually do say, they have to connect. What does this confess? Your funeral must actually confess something good. Um, you, you have to confess the resurrection at your funeral. Pastor Borkhart writes uh, from Nagel, who the, the great uh, sainted uh, Dr. Norman Nagel, don't go on and on about the person who fell asleep at a funeral. There are family members who knew that Aunt Clara wasn't always sweet. Preach Christ and him crucified, then your words will be Jesus sure. That's beautiful. Um, I'm giving that up here. Uh, it's over text, that's, un that's uncomfortable, but um, that, that, that's, that's very wonderful. Um, when we preach at a funeral, um, you also just sort of, yeah, then don't have to dress up words into making them a person they weren't. Uh, it's almost sort of like we're trying to convince God to let somebody into heaven, the God who died on the cross to let them into the resurrection. Uh, it's almost like we need to convince ourselves and each other that they can earn salvation. But in all of it, just preach Christ, and then you can say that sinner is somebody that Jesus lied for, or died for. Um, I have three rules for my funeral. Um, there, there are three, and I tell them uh, everywhere I go, everywhere I'm sent, I, I figure I'm probably going to die here. Uh, because, well, lots of reasons. Uh, so I tell my people from very, very early on, I have three rules for my funeral. Uh, first, um, talk about Jesus and not me. Don't talk about me, talk about Jesus. Um, second, sing good hymns that actually talk about the issue in the room. Don't just sort of pick your favorite hymn, but actually talk about or sing the hymns that confront the last great enemy in the room. So so I, I know you, you might just really like how great thou art, uh, but what does it actually say to this moment? Uh, so sing... All saints hymns sing behold a host arrayed in white sing easter hymns sing hymns that talk about the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting uh it's 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 not that uh, how great thou art is a, a, a well it's not my favorite song because most of the times i hear it uh it's people trying to convince themselves in the midst of everything wrong that god is good because it's a nice day outside um even though they're having one of the worst days of their lives read the, the lyrics sometimes and uh look at how we employ it is it actually addressing the elephant in the room that is death or is it just sort of trying to skirt the cause Sing good hymns that actually address the elephant in the room. Sing about how Jesus conquered death. And the third rule that I have at my funeral is don't ever let a district president come and give a plaque to anybody uh, because that, that undoes the whole gospel that might be preached. So preach uh, about Jesus and not me. Sing good hymns and don't let district presidents give plaques. They can come, just no, no plaques. I want baptism. I don't want a plaque. Baptismal hymns are great at funerals too, Jacoby. I like that. Um, what does this confess? So of all the stuff that's going on at a funeral, um, that's what we're going to ask, because uh, the, the, the scriptures are actually helpful in this, uh, oddly enough. 1 Corinthians 10.23, um, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. There are a lot of things maybe you could do at a funeral, but should you do it? Are you helping or are you hurting by doing this thing? What does this confess? Uh, we want something that is helpful to the people there mourning. Um, and, and so could you theoretically have a trampoline at your funeral because it would make people happy? Uh, just putting that out there, it'd be fun. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, be still my soul, good one. Uh, is, it, is it helpful to the gospel to have a trampoline at a funeral? Um, I had to redo some planning uh, for myself. Uh, when I realized that. Uh, instead of that, though, maybe a funeral, Paul. Uh, a white uh, burial cloth draped over the casket as a remembrance of baptism, a remembrance that, that, that this body will, will rise with Christ, uh, a, a remembrance that even as Christ left behind his burial cloths for you, having risen from the dead, he left them folded in the tomb that you could wear them so that you would also rise from the dead, you might have a confession that you're not just simply looking at a pretty casket that is still 
death, but you're looking forward to the resurrection. Uh, another thing to maybe uh, recognize as we're dealing with this, uh, Romans 14, 13, uh, when you're dealing with a, a funeral, uh, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Uh, remember that what you're doing at, at, uh, at your funeral might actually have a, a confession to be made to somebody else. So don't put a stumbling block in somebody else's way. Um, and, and so this might not be uh, the funeral, the time for all the old drinking stories. The wake might be a better place for it. Um, but if we're going to put something in, in uh, somebody's way that, that would cause them to stumble, uh, at the one point in time where the devil will, will prey on us the most, uh, in the face of this last great enemy, uh, here we must confess only Christ and him crucified. Here we must confess only Christ is risen from the dead, uh, because anything less than Jesus who has conquered death at a funeral is not enough. We need more. So don't put up anything that, that is optional but still causes somebody else to, to stumble. And then Titus, uh, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law for they are unprofitable and worthless. Uh, don't let anybody make new laws to what can and can't be done at a funeral. You already have 10 commandments you still can't do, so maybe just work on those first uh, before you start inventing new ones. But, but at the same time, um, while all things are lawful, uh, recognize that we want to confess Christ. So th there's not a, if, if you are subjected to this, you can't be in heaven, um, or, or if you don't do this at a funeral, or if there are flowers here, or, or a, a casket here, or, or heaven for birdie, maybe even an urn somewhere, um, or, or not a pall, and, and all of these things, it, it's just a simple question. What are you trying to confess? Where is Jesus? How has he conquered death? Where's the hope? That's what we're trying to do at a funeral. As, as Jacob, as Israel is falling asleep in the Lord, uh, the one thing that he calls his, uh, his children to do uh, is, is to bury him. Uh, bury him in the promised land. Take me back to the, the, the cave uh, of, of Abraham, my forefather, uh, of, of Isaac, and now of me. Bury me in the right place. Bury me in the promised land, the land that God has promised to us and our forefathers. Uh, it, it, it confesses something. Uh, does it matter if Jacob is, is buried in that cave or not? No. Like, God will still raise him on the last day, even if he didn't make it to the cave. He, he, because the, the, the question of, of resurrection is answered in Jesus, not Jacob. But Jacob insists on being buried in the land, in the cave of his forefathers, because he's tying himself to the resurrection for other people to see. It's not for him, it's for other people to see. The, the funeral is um, a, a chance to, to actually see the resurrection confessed to your neighbor. Jacob hoped in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, and so he wanted to be buried in the land that God has promised that signified the resurrection. He wanted uh, to, to remember, uh, or he wanted, excuse me, his children to remember this promised land, not the wealth of the land of Egypt. Because remember, things were about to be real good. Uh, Jacob saw this as he was uh, brought into Egypt. Uh, he, he saw this is going to be a, a, a real, this is going to be a sweet gig, guys. Um, and, and he recognized uh, that, that this would be a great place to take your eye off the ball. This would be a great place to try and settle down again, apart from God's promise, again, and fixate on wealth and worldly riches again. And so he says, now take me back to the promised land, because yeah, it's a great place to live right now, but there is more. Don't ever forget that there is more. Uh, he, he, he wants his, his children to, to focus on the, the promise of, of God. Um, and so he takes them to the place that points to a resurrection, that a place that ties them to those who have fallen asleep in the Lord and, and would be uh, brought out again. Uh, because this is the, probably the best place in the world to expose idolatry for what it is, uh, death. All the idols uh, start to flee from death because they can't conquer it. But your Lord already has. And so what's being done um, as, as Jacob falls asleep in his Lord uh, is to confess that all of the idolatry won't stand but the promise of god will so remember that because some of them are going to have real nice lives like he just blessed asher with lots of food i'm still fixated on that because we do this just uh just before my snacky snack time um <laughs> i have to laugh at all my own jokes now because my youth leader made fun of me for it uh it, it's just me here and so if nobody laughs it's just awkward and so i kind of just started awkwardly laughing at the, the silence and now i do it on purpose just to annoy her Sarah, if you're listening to this, I'm laughing at my own jokes on purpose because of you. <laughs> so, uh, we also see Jacob buried in the promised land um, as a physical testimony to the preservation of preaching this doctrine. 
he actually wants the same sermons that he heard as a child continue to share to be shared among his children. Uh, he, he, he physically ties himself to a, an, an outward confession of truth. He physically ties himself to a place where, where God, uh, I, I thought Thor laughed, uh, he, he physically ties himself to a place that, that will make you be confronted with the truth of God's mercy, of God's resurrection, a, a, and at last, a, a tie to the company of heaven. Um, what, what he's done, or what he insists being done to him, uh, that he'd be buried in the promised land, it, it's a confession of faith. And at the exact same time, um, you also have uh, you also have Joseph make a confession of his own faith. Genesis 50, where last chapter, guys, last chapter. All right, um, we're gonna finish it tomorrow, one way or another. I'm just putting that out there, one way or another. Uh, Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants and the physicians to embalm the father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, and that is how many days are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. To laugh at your joke is okay. It's when you start talking to yourself. They start preparing a room for you. Oops, been there, doing that. Um, my thoughts on cremation. Why are you making more laws? where the, the Lord hasn't made any. Uh, the question is still always, what does this confess? And so there, there are ungodly things you can do with a body, and there are godly things you can do with a body. And there are ungodly things you can do with cremation, and there are godly things you can do with cremation. There are 10 commandments. Which commandment does cremation break? Um, and, and I say that because um, it, it's not because I'm trying to, to muddy the waters. It's because I'm actually trying to find a little bit of nuance in it. Uh, Jesus can resurrect a cremated body. Again, Jesus can resurrect a cremated body. Again, Jesus can resurrect a cremated body. Baptism now saves you. Um, at the same time, what does this confess? So what do you want to do with this cremated body? I think uh, it, we, we have to confess, uh, uh, we, we live in a time where uh, there, there are people who simply can't afford a proper burial. Uh, down in town, San Antonio, plots are not cheap. And what we have are our medical bills that are getting more expensive. I, and so this is a question of conscience. If all you can afford is a cremation, why would this prohibit you from entering the kingdom of God? He, he took poorer people than us up. Um, but maybe when we have to be confronted with cremation, we should still put a pall on this urn. We should still bury it uh, in a confession of faith that the resurrection would still happen. Maybe we should not look backwards. So when you take the, this urn, are you looking forward to the resurrection? Are you burying it in expectation and hope? Or are you like, I want to go and sprinkle his ashes on the lake because he remembered. Uh, I remember how he liked to go fishing. Um, are you looking backwards at something he used to do as if that's over and this is your last chance to remember? Or are you looking forward in expectation of hope? Everything that you're doing must confess hope. So take this urn, put a pall on it, bury it in the expectation of resurrection. To sort of put it in the lake is all you're doing is saying, he liked to fish and that's what I remember. There's no forward from that. We need something that goes forward. Uh, and, and remember, there's, there's also um, something ungodly you can do with a body. Um, why do we bury our bodies with trinkets? Like they need to pass the river sticks. Uh, have you seen Weekend at Bernie's, if you want an 80s reference? Uh, I, I don't think it's rated PG. If you haven't seen it, probably skip that one. Um, but, but recognize that, that um, everything that we do, everything that we do in death should confess the resurrection. Um, there are no laws about this. There are good practices and, and bad practices, uh, but we wanna, we wanna help confess the resurrection. We don't wanna hinder. We don't wanna cause a stumbling block. Um, and, and so we can recognize that yes, there, there, are, um, th there are some things that are probably more helpful than others, but why would you go making laws when you already can't live up to the 10 that God gave you? Uh, let your hope be in the resurrection. And, and so let what you do to the very best of your ability confess the resurrection. Um, and, and then recognize there's also not prescribed hymns for funerals. We, we just list, listed a whole bunch of them in the comments. Um, and and I, have, I have sort of my favorite ones too. Um, but at the same time, um, each of them confesses the resurrection in a different way. And that's a joyful thing. Be free in the gospel. This, is, this, this here is a gift, a, a last chance to see the resurrection proclaimed. Um, why would you curse it? by saying if you don't do these things you cannot be saved when the whole point of your salvation is that you didn't do those things to be saved jesus did them for you uh so so yeah um that's kind of this though when when we talk about how it is that, that we prepare bodies i, I kind of wanted to hit cremation but uh, uh uh jacoby came right out and asked it so we're gonna we're gonna answer it um there's there's one more thing and i'll leave you um joseph fell on his father's face and wept over his body and kissed him uh joseph kissed his father's 
dead body. This this wasn't given yet, Numbers 1911. This wasn't on Joseph yet, but at the same time, it, it was still a taboo even back then. Um, not Joshua. Numbers 1911. Uh, Whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. Again, this law hadn't yet been given through Moses, um, and it hasn't yet been fulfilled in uh, Christ um, and, and done away with, but at the same time, uh, it, it was an unclean thing. When, when Joseph falls upon Jacob and kisses his face, it's because he actually believes he's not dead, he's just sleeping. He doesn't, he, he doesn't think he's dead. This is a, a confession. This body is not dead. It will rise. This body is just sleeping. On the last day, he will come alive again and we will see him again because I am a part of that same promise. I am a part of that same covenant given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now now even Joseph is a part of this. Uh, the, the, the great promise that, that God would work mercy uh, in death and resurrection is, is at last proclaimed in that which is confessed here. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, I'm distracted easily. Uh, plus, I'm at time. So uh, on, on that note, uh, thank you guys so much for hanging out today. Uh, I, I think tomorrow we're going to try and finish Genesis one way or another. Thank you all so much. Again, please remember Pastor Borghart and especially his family in your prayers. Uh, rejoice in, in the God who uh, even in, in the face of death works resurrection and life. Lord be with you.